so aurangzeb right so uh, he is also known as alangir and uh, he was the seventh mughal emperor he was ruling from uh, 15 1658 to till his death that is 1707 right we can say he is the last of the last in the series of great mughal emperors right so rise to power if we see he was the third son of the uh, shah jahan so unlike his brothers uh, who were raised in luxury aurangzeb is known for his austerity and uh, we can say piety so he was a religious person he was a strict religious person good evening students welcome back to plutus is right today is our 65th day and today we are studying mughal dynasty so mostly in this also i am going to focus on the uh, rulers only uh, rest of the things we will cover when we discuss the culture or uh, art and culture aspects so apart from this uh, previous i mean yesterday i have discussed the delta uh, delhi sultanate dynasties and apart from that i mentioned uh, uh we i mean various number of dynasties like uh, vijayanagara empire bahmani sultans etc and the kingdoms in gujarat and bengal also apart from south india also you have to study some dynasties like later cholas or greater cholas also great they are also known as greater chola so you have to study about these dynasties also so try to cover uh, those dynasties in your uh, preparation <coughs> right so today we will study about the mughal dynasty you know very well it is one of the most most famous dynasties not only in medieval india but also we can say in the entire indian uh, history right so the mughal dynasty their origin is they belong to a uh turkish mongol origin they have a turkish mongol origin so the uh, founder of the dynasty babur he has the roots of uh, timur and also the uh, also chinggis khan who were considered i mean these two these two rulers are considered as the greatest rulers <coughs> i mean they known for their we can say military prowess and expansion of uh, their empire timur and uh, chinggis khan so babur he had the roots from these two people so uh, one i mean one side he has the roots from the mother side and uh, from the other ruler ruler he has the he has roots from the, his father's side right so we can say uh, the period between 16th century to 18th century so this period is known for uh, known for the rule of the mughal uh, mughal or we can say existence of mughal uh, empire in india right <coughs> so it is not only known for military prowess the rulers are not, not only known for military prowess especially the uh, first sequence of first rulers uh, starting from babur to aurangzeb they are known as greater uh, greater mughals so there are i mean there were again i mean the mughal dynasty was there till 1857 for all uh, for the we can say purposes for uh, theoretical purposes but uh, after the end of the aurangzeb's rule in 1707 we can say practically the authority of the mughals has ended so after that we will see a series of weak mughal rulers <coughs> weak mughal rulers i mean they are only puppets on the throne uh, they have been either controlled by nobles for a period of uh, time they were controlled by nobles so the nobles were uh, pulling all the strings they were uh, dominating the affairs after that the marathas marathas have dominated the scene and after that the britishers britishers so these uh, these were the dominant powers so the mughal rulers they remained only as puppets on the throne so they are known as the lesser mughals or the later mughals we will also briefly see about them right so uh, founder is babur <coughs> he ruled between 1526 to 
so famous rulers in this are akbar shah jahan and aurangzeb we also can include humayun in this right so humayun starting from babar humayun akbar shah jahan aurangzeb and humayun apart from that jahangir also so all these rulers they are considered as the greater rulers so not only they are known for their military prowess but also the contribution in art and architecture art and architecture also immense very i mean very huge except aurangzeb though there was a i mean patronage for art and culture but it is very very less we can say it's very very less because Aur- aurangzeb he was strictly following the theor- uh, muslim uh, we can say traditions or rules or he was strictly, strictly following the sharia law sharia uh, sharia law and uh, uh, whatever the islamic texts are there so because of that we will see a decline in the patronage for art and architecture right so this is a brief introduction about the mughal dynasty uh, so we can see the territorial exp- expansion during the mughal rule so first <coughs> when babar occupied i mean came to india and uh, he defeated lodi <laughs> ibrahim lodi in the first battle of panipat so his empire confined empire confined to this region by the time of akbar we will see a great expansion of the kingdom so almost the entire north india <coughs> and also some parts of the uh, deccan peninsula that have been ca- captured and integrated with the mughal empire so by the time of aurangzeb we will see almost all the entire india leaving only a small part in the southern peninsula <coughs> uh remaining aloof with the mughal empire apart from that entire indian subcontinent has come under the control of uh, mughals by the time of aurangzeb so this type of we can say integration of india before independence or during the britishers we will so- see only once or twice once during the period of mauryan empire or mauryan dynasty or during especially during ashoka time and the second briefly during the uh tughlaq dynasty during the uh, delhi sultanate period tughlaq dynasty also we will see a greater uh, integration of india to a greater extent but however this much integration we will only especially see during the uh, mauryan time only right <coughs> so uh, uh so this is a, this is about the territorial expansion of uh, mughal empire so now we will see one by one important rulers in the mughal dynasty so babar <coughs> he ruled india between 1526 to 1530 so he is uh, known for his victories especially in the first battle of panipat uh, through which uh, he has captured some territories in india and he established the mughal dynasty so fifth first battle of panipat it has occurred in 1526 right <coughs> so babar's innovative use of cannons and other other artillery uh, helped him to him to win the war against ibrahim lodi so apart from military conquest uh, babar's contribution is there immensely in areas like uh, he is considered i mean he is the founder of the mughal dynasty that is their military strategist so he is known for his military strategy so because of military strategy only though his numbers are way less than that of the ibrahim lodi's numbers uh, when the uh, first battle of panipat was taking place still he could win the war because of his strategy only right administration he has also credited with establishing we can say he is strong and a centralized centralized administration apart from that he implemented a land revenue system that helped stabilize the revenues of the uh we can say empire <coughs> right cultural legacy so uh, babar was a patron of arts and uh, sciences he also wrote uh, wrote his uh, autobiography uh, babar nama it is known as babar nama uh, which is uh, which is considered as a historic valuable uh, book so it is uh, written in i think th- th- turkish language turkish language <coughs> right so this is his autobiography right so this is about babar so uh, only brief i mean he ruled only for a period of brief briefly for 4 years 
so after that we will see the rule of humayun right so we will consider uh, i mean we can consider humayun as a fortunate and also at the same time an unfortunate for person because during his uh, rule his uh, his fortunes have changed so one time fortune favored him and another time it also disfavored him so he has to engage in a struggle with the su dynasty su dynasty so especially sher shah sur for some period of time he displaced humayun and ruled over uh, ruled over uh, the indian subcontinent i mean whatever the mughal dynasty is there so he captured by defeating and uh, uh, <coughs> making humayun to leave the country leave india and uh, he ruled so approximately entirely su dynasty ruled for 10 years however after the death of sher shah suri another rule uh, ruler came uh, in the su dynasty so by taking the advantage of that and also taking help uh, from the at that time the iranian empire so taking help from them he uh, once again invaded india after the death of sher shah sur and once again he was able to capture uh, delhi and again he restarted the mughal empire we can say mughal dynasty or mughal empire right so humayun uh, his actual name is nazir aldin muhammad right <coughs> he was the second mughal emperor so he ruled between 1530 and 1540 once again after capturing power so 15 he ruled bit, again between 1555 to 56 right so his reign is uh, marked by struggle and instability with the periods of exile and the challenges from rival afghan rulers right so humayun was the eldest son of babar the uh, right he inherited throne at a young age lacking experience and ruthless ruthlessness of his father so he faced immense th- threats from his half brother uh, kamran mirza and afghan uh, warlords like sher shah suri so this we have already seen all right so uh, he has to uh, lose his empire and he has to exile so sher shah suri he has to lost kingdom to sher shah suri in the uh, i mean he was uh, sher shah suri defeated by uh, sorry sher shah suri defeated humayun at the battles of chausa and kanauj uh, because of that humayun has to exile uh, for over 15 years all right so during his uh, exile he wandered through persia seeking support from safavid rulers so at last he got support from them safavid rulers and he was once again came back to india and captured and restarted his dynasty right so with persian aid humayun eventually recaptured delhi in 1555 right right so however he met uh, he met with an accident while uh, <coughs> so he met with an accident and he had to die after immediately after one year after we can say uh, recapturing india <coughs> right right so uh, his famous contribution we will say the humayun tomb which is in delhi uh, it is we can say one of the beautiful creation of mughal architecture and uh, this humayun tomb it is also considered as the precursor precursor to the taj mahal so taj mahal was the pinnacle uh, in the mughal art and architecture architecture so that all the styles that are there in the uh, i mean uh, taj mahal they have experimented at the uh, humayun tomb right so this is about briefly about humayun right next is uh, akbar so he is considered as the one of the greatest rulers in india so he is among the greatest rulers of india not only for his uh, military prowess he is also known for his religious tolerance religious tolerance right so he is not only known for his military prowess efficient administration creation of innovative taxation system that is known as mansabdari system mansabdari system he has created a new uh, taxation system with uh, with the help of his we can say devout assistant 
तोडरमल राइट सो तोडरमल हेल्प तोडरमल हेल्प इन इस्टैब्लिशिंग दिस सिस्टम मनसबदारी सिस्टम सो अपार्ट फ्रॉम अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट ही इज आल्सो ग्रेट पैटर्न ऑफ आर्ट एंड आर्किटेक्चर आर्किटेक्चर सो अपार्ट फ्रॉम ऑल दीज थिंग्स the his uh, religious tolerance policy i mean uh, i mean he realized that india is a i mean Hin- india is a hindu dominated country and a, it is a mix of religions it is not possible in Indi- india to uh, i mean rule strictly according to the islamic rules so he followed a liberal religious policy so uh, his mother also if i say his father though he is a muslim his mother was a rajput uh, princess uh, so because of that ba- that he has both roots of both the we can say islamic and indian or hindu uh, we can say roots so because of that also we will see the influence of uh, because of that influence so influence also we can see a liberal religious policy tolerant policy of akbar right so akbar came to throne uh, at the young age of 13 years because the sudden death of humayun so initially he ruled with the help of uh, bairam khan who was uh, who acted as a regent for akbar but once he came to age uh, he sent bairam khan to exile or he sent bairam khan to go to makkah and spend his rest of life and he started ruling on his own so he was a skilled military leader this we already know he significantly expanded the mughal empire so we will see his conquest all his conquest because this uh, it is an important area right so he conquered vast territories bringing most of the indian subcontinent except the southern part into the ambit of the mughal empire right so religious he is also known for his religious tolerance right so one of the uh, if we can say it his religious policy is one of the remarkable features so he broke away from the traditional islamic rule and implemented a policy of inclusion towards hindus and other religions right so he created his own religion uh, basically it was taking features of all the religions all the dominant or existing religions at that time and he created Uh, his own religion the ilahi ilahi but uh, somehow it failed to attract the people uh, because one thing because uh, it was not forced on the people it was uh, he offered this religion pe- to people voluntarily so those who are willing they can only join the religion so because of that also it failed to attract the people right administrative reforms so he is a, we can say he is a visionary administrator he implemented significant reforms to strengthen the empire so he uh, he is known for establishing centralized and controlled and efficient administrative system he reformed the tax uh, taxation system he classified land so most of the he adapted for taxation system actually sher shah sur uh sher shah sur uh, he was also known for efficient administration so he somehow he tried to implement i mean reform the tax system in india so akbar has adapted the taxation policy that has been developed by sher shah suri like classification of land and the tax is being collected by measuring the land area land is divided into different types fertile area twice i mean irrigated area non irrigated area fertile area non fertile area etc so land has been classified into uh, various categories and based on the type uh, only the taxation has been imposed right apart from that he introduced a new land revenue system we can say or uh, the administrative system a complete administrative system mansabdari system akbar has created so we will see how mansabdari system works and the uh, end uh, during the uh, rule of aurangzeb how the system has faced crisis how crisis has occurred in the mansabdari system and how it became a crucial factor for the downfall of mughal empire right 
so cultural legacy he is also known for patronage of art and architecture uh, apart from that he is also a great patron of sciences so he is his court attracted scholars artists and poets from all walks of life <coughs> he also cons- uh, i mean commissioned construction of magnificent buildings including the city of fatehpur sikri right so sometimes he uh, made fatehpur uh, sikri as capital but because of non availability of water here uh, due to the water problem he had to again uh, i mean bring back the capital to delhi so he wanted to be uh, he wanted fatehpur fatehpur sikri to be capital right so this is about briefly about akbar akbar so other things like his contribution in art and architecture literature etc we will see in the art and architecture topics so one thing we have to study about akbar is his conquest conquest so previously there were i mean questions have been asked from the conquest of akbar so we should know in detail about the conquest of akbar so apart from that we also uh, should be aware of the policies of akbar various policies like religious policy and also his policy towards rajputs and you have to study the policy difference in policy of uh, akbar towards rajput and the policy of aurangzeb also so there is a marked difference of policy towards the rajputs we can say this is also another factor uh, for the fall of the mughal empire the changed policy of aurangzeb towards the rajputs right so here we will see the military conquests of akbar uh he ruled between uh, this point we know 1556 to 1605 so most part of this ruling period his uh, i mean he dedicated towards he devoted towards uh, we can say uh, wars only most of the part he dedicated or he spent his time on wars only right so early early consolidation consolidation it is 1556 to 1560 so he fought second battle of panipat uh, with his uh, regent only uh, <coughs> so he i mean uh, he sorry this battle battle was fought with hemu uh, we can say he was a previously he was advisor to sur dynasty uh, he basically he was a bindu a hindu so it was known as a battle between uh, hindu uh, i mean it was a final effort to restore the uh hindu uh, ruling once again in the country but however uh, whatever may be the we can say interpretation uh, hemu was defeated by akbar in the second battle of panipat uh, in 1556 so with this akbar's rule has been once again consolidated and reasserted right uh, next he conquest uh, he conquered gwalior and malwa between 1559 and 1516 16 so these victories secured him important forts forts for the defense of the territories next next we will see the expansion into rajputana between 1560 and 1580 so almost for uh, 20 years he was waging wars in rajputana right so in military campaigns uh, he followed different strategies to gain control over rajputana region so one among them one is military campaigns so he waged the military campaigns and captured forts like chitorgarh and ranthambore uh, but often avoided large scale battles because he wanted to maintain friendly relation with rajputs right so diplomatic uh, diplomacy and uh, marriage alliances so mostly mostly with many uh, rajput kingdoms he formed marriage alliances and he accepted rajput princesses as wives he ha- he has taken uh, many rajput princesses as wives and uh, thereby he acquired uh, control over the uh, many rajput kingdoms so these are the different strategies adopted by him to gain control over rajputana right so after that conquest we will see conquest over uh, west and east also so gujarat he waged conquest on gujarat in 1584 right so the conquest brought control over important ports and trade routes on arabian sea coast right 
so in 1584 he captured gujarat kabul he also ca- captured kabul in 1585 and kashmir in 1586 57 sindh in 1591 so with all these we can say conquest the western border western border of india has been secured once again so in beng i mean he captured bengal also in 1592 so this is a crucial victory because bengal is known for its wealth and also for trade so with the i mean gaining control over bengal so lot of we can say prosperous region has come under the control of mughal empire right so later campaign also we will see he waged conquest in dakkan also in the uh, i mean in dakkan however the results in the dakkan are mixed mixed so we can say uh, the ambitions to control also gain control over dakkan and south india those ambitions of uh, akbar remained only as ambitions he could not succeed much uh, i mean over dakkan even after him jahangir and uh, uh, shah jahan also uh, we can say unable to they they are we can say in one way they failed to capture dakkan and the south india it was only during the rule of aurangzeb aurangzeb uh, the mughals could capture dakkan and south india that too came with a very high cost or huge cost so this uh, dakkan dakkan policy adopted by aurangzeb we will also study that so he Uh, at any cost he wanted to capture dakkan and also capture south india so because of that reason he almost spent 25 years in dakkan aurangzeb and uh, it uh, also became one of the factors for decline of mughal empire we will see that but however uh, when we dis- we are discussing about akbar so his ambitions or uh, ambitions or goals or we can say desire of capturing the kan and south india it remained only as a desire right so uh, akbar's military success can be attributed to several factors such as innovative strategies so he is known for his innovative strategies and uh, strong leadership he provided very strong leadership diplomacy and alliances so especially with the rajputs he given importance i mean he gave importance to alliances and uh, we can say marriage uh, marriage relations over uh, we can say outright waging of war right so because of this strategies he was more and more successful uh, with the rajput and gaining control over rajputs so because of this policy many rajput princes sorry uh, many rajput princes uh, uh, they have joined as nobles and imp- important members in the court of akbar so if we see the uh, highest rank rank holder under akbar was a rajput uh, in the mansabdari system raja jay singh raja jay singh he was the highest rank holder in the mansabdari system he was holding the highest rank so with this we can understand the policy successful policy of uh, akbar when it comes to rajputs so rajputs have become we can say very very important nobles in the court of akbar so he were they were helping akbar in his campaigns and um, i mean we can say uh, whenever he waged wars apart from that they also played a crucial role in crucial role in administration also administration also right right so this is about the mansabdari uh, sorry this is about akbar's policy right so now we will study the mansabdari system and uh, how it failed in the end right so two terms you have to remember when it comes to mansabdari system those are jat and sawar so jat and sawar come i mean together this is known as rank rank in the mansabdari system sawar is nothing but the number of horses the number of horses that the particular we can say noble has to maintain so together this number of jat and sawar it will decide the rank of the particular person or noble or officer right so it is a critical administrative and military structure that is developed by akbar with the help of todarmal right 
so uh, there were ranks so the nobles or officials were given ranks so based on those ranks they were given salaries right right so uh, they are known as mansabs and they are given man- i mean they are the man- ranks are known as mansabs and based on the rank only the salary of the official is decided salary of the official is divided so in lieu of salary sometimes they have given the territory in lieu of salary sometimes they have given the territory also so each mansab had a specific pay grade and carried obligations for both military and the service and the civilian administration also right so a mansabdar was to hold a holder of a rank and each mansabdar was expected to maintain a specific number of cavalry men and known as sawars so the higher the rank the more sawars mansabdar had to maintain right so jagirs in, instead of direct cash salaries sometimes uh, mansabdars were uh, granted jagirs which were land grants from the revenue uh, from the revenue collected from these territories they would pay their own salaries and maintain their assigned sawars so the system ensured well equipped military without a massive cash burden on the central treasury so this was advantage is there in the beginning but what happened later by the time of uh, we can say by the time of aurangzeb what happened with the by the time of aurangzeb many nobles number of nobles have increased nobles have increased nobles have i mean kept on the mughal emperors kept on recruiting and accumulating nobles they have because there are nobles they have they should be given some ranking right ranking has given to them but once ranking is given either they have to uh, either they have to be given salary or they have to be give assigned uh, they have to be assigned a territory right so what happened the number of nobles have increased but there was no land or sufficient money to give them uh, as a salary or as a assignment as a jagir so because of this there was discontent arose in the nobles discontent arose in the nobles and uh, uh, apart from that the ranks also the ranks also have increased inorbitantly i mean without any we can say without any substantial uh, addition to the territory of the uh, mughal dynasty or mughal empire so the rankings also kept on increasing rankings also kept on increasing so once ranking is increasing the number of cavalry or sawars that have to be maintained by a noble will also increase but the nobles they do not have the sufficient territory to uh, maintain that many number of sawars so this also led to uh, a kind of crisis so that thing is combined with all these things that is known as mansabdari crisis so the nobles were very very much we can say discontent so only way the nobles will be given sufficient land is through is by waging wars on the we can say other territories that are not there in the mughal empire and assigning those lands to the uh, we can say already recruited nobles or already included nobles so however uh, after winning the uh, entire north india so some of the territory even uh, some of the territories that were captured in uh, deccan so only few only few territories remain to be captured especially in south india that i mean th- capturing those territories also became very very tough because of the resistance of the i mean uh, the regional rulers uh, regional r- rulers best example is the capture of or we can say seize of golconda seize of golconda so you know very well aurangzeb seized this fort fort for almost 6 months Uh, so even after that also the i mean the, the i mean the golconda rulers were they were not willing to surrender to akbar because they had a very good defense system uh, golconda fort is considered as one of the strongest fort, fort uh, forts in the uh, south india not only in south india for that matter in the entire india also it is one of the formidable forts so even after we can say passage of 6 months 
the golconda rulers were unwilling unwilling to surrender to aurangzeb so that was the challenge apart from that you will also see the maratha confederates maratha confederacy so they were also uh, resorting to guerrilla warfare guerrilla warfare and they have also posed a very strong challenge to the mughals and their expansion so because of this policy the territory i mean because of all these reasons the territory was not expanding so the uh, because the territory is not expanding there is no territory to give uh, to be given to these uh, nobles already inducted nobles so all this kind of led to a crisis financial crisis including all i mean an entire thing went into crisis so this is known as mansabdari crisis so mansabdari crisis is also known as the important factors for the downfall of the mughal empire right so this is the this is uh, i mean this is a brief explanation of the mansabdari crisis right so the points here in the mansabdari crisis are inflation and jagir jagir shortage so this we have already discussed so the prices have risen but there is a shortage of jagirs sufficient land to be given to nobles uh, rise in fictitious ranks so without assigning land titles only the ranks have been increased by leaps and bounds so that was all, that was also creating problem focus on quantity over quantity so just uh, the i mean quantitatively the number of sawars or for that matter the number of ranks have been increased with the with the not focusing on the quality of the sawars maintained so these were the factors <coughs> so what happened the conse consequences of the crisis were weakened military military has been weakened economic strain so there was i mean strain on the treasury right so loss of morale so morale of the nobles has been lost because of all these reasons so so this is this i mean these are the consequences of the crisis in mansabdari system right so now we will see this is about uh, akbar and his two important uh, we can say aspects we have studied in akbar one uh, one is his military conquest and the second thing is his mansabdari system and how it went into crisis during the period of aurangzeb right so after that now we will study about aurangzeb so aurangzeb <coughs> right so he ruled between so his uh, lifetime lifetime is between 1569 to 16 uh, 1627 so uh, i mean jahangir we can say his rule uh, entirely if you see his uh, we can say evaluation if you see it is a we can say it is a mixed experience right so earlier in his uh, we can say career or in earlier in his uh, life life he was very ambitious ambitious and somewhat he was we can say uh, he wanted to capture the power so because uh, he revolted against his father uh, akbar he revolted against his own father akbar and he wanted to have power so uh, during the early stages of his his uh, life he was somewhat we can say restless and after once he captured power and because of his we can say fondness for alcohol alcohol and uh, some other addicts he mostly left rule for his uh, wife beloved or favorite wife we can say nur jahan and uh, nur jahan was maintaining most of the official or uh, issue or we can say most of the issues or aspects related to court so he you can say he retired uh, i mean indirectly he retired and the most of the things related to court have been overseen by his wife nur jahan so this is the uh, we can say the <coughs> brief uh, brief we can say brief uh, explanation of uh, jahangir right so jahangir's relationship with his father akbar was a complex one so he was impatient for the throne and even rebelled against his father in 1599 so after akbar's death jahangir ascended throne right so <coughs> jahangir asc ascended throne he came to power so <coughs> his major contributions can be seen in the art and architecture arena 
so art and architecture arena we will see his major uh, contribution so he started the painting concept concept i mean conceptual uh, he ca he started a different theme in painting that is miniature painting miniature painting right <coughs> so uh, jahangir's reign was a flourishing period for mughal art so he was he was a passionate uh, pattern of arts especially painting and a miniature master feature features so uh, master pieces so he himself jahangir uh, jahangir himself was a great uh, painter right so he encouraged the fusion of mughal mughal and also european styles leading a distinctive and vibrant art artistic movement right his own personal journal journals and the memoirs offer valuable insights into his life thoughts and the mughal court right so political complexities we have also seen so uh, he faced the rebellions including from his own brother khusru meza right so his fondness for alcohol and also opium uh, raised concerns about his leadership so in later part of his rule he i mean he went into background and nur jahan nur jahan become the real power behind behind the throne right so marriage and power dynamics if you see so mehru he is married to mehru nisa uh, after marriage she was no she was come to be known as uh, nur jahan so nur jahan became powerful political figure wielding considerable influence behind the throne right so her shrewdness and the political acumen are well documented and she even appeared on mughal coins uh, which was a rare rare honor so she can be compared uh, during the slave dynasty uh, nur jahan right nur jahan can be compared with rajia sultana rajia sultana during the slave dynasty after the death of althamash so because of any capable uh, ruler uh, uh, nur jahan uh, sorry rajia sultana came to power only difference between these two uh, we can say rulers is uh, rajia sultana directly assumed the throne and uh, she uh, sat on the throne whereas nur jahan uh, we can say controlled everything but behind i uh, mean from the behind scenes she controlled everything right so this is about uh, jahangir right so however uh, jahangir is more much more known for his contribution in the field of art and architecture and uh, even fine arts uh, and uh, more than that of that of his military conquests right so now after that uh, shah jahan has assumed the throne right his time period is between 1592 to 1666 so uh, he was the fifth mughal emperor ruling from 15 i mean 1628 to 1658 right so his rule is known for two things one thing is the architectural marvel taj mahal and a period of cultural and artistic zenith for the mughal empire right so if you see coming up uh, his coming to power he was uh, earlier his known uh, name is prince kurram and uh, shah jahan was his uh, adopted title and he was the third son of jahangir right and he is also remember one thing he is also the son of nur jahan right so after Jah jahangir's death in 1627 shah jahan emerged vict victorious in a war of succession against his brothers and uh, he win uh, he win over his brothers and he came to power right so the glory of mughals we can see the mughal empire reached its zenith in various fields including art and architecture fine arts etc especially in the uh, regime of culture it reached its pinnacle right so uh, shah jahan's reign is considered as pinnacle of mughals architecture and artistic ach achievements right he was a great pattern of arts uh, commissioning magnificent uh, buildings like red fort jama masjid and uh, of course taj mahal also right so taj mahal it was uh, built it was built as a mausoleum for his uh, favorite wife muntaz mahal right so in the uh, taj mahal we will see a blend of 
పర్షియన్ అండ్ ఇండియన్ స్టైల్స్ షూ కాజింగ్ అండ్ ఎక్స్ ఎక్విజిట్ ఎక్స్క్విజిట్ మాస్టర్ పీస్ సో ఇఫ్ యూ సీ మిలిటరీ ఎక్స్పాన్షన్ అండ్ అడ్మినిస్ట్రేషన్ ఆఫ్ షాజహాన్ సో షాదహా షాజహాన్స్ ఫోకస్ వజ్ ఆన్ ఆర్టిస్టిక్ పర్స్యూట్ ఈజ్ వెల్ నోన్ హవ్ ఎవర్ హీ ఈజ్ ఆల్సో నోన్ నోన్ యాజ్ ఎ కేపబుల్ మిలిటరీ లీడర్ so he expanded the mughal empire borders in the deccan plateau and central asia right so he continued the efficient administrative system established by his predecessor predecessors like akbar and aurangzeb right so uh, the later part of shah jahan's rule was marked by uh, we can say decline uh, the lavish spending on the arch- architectural uh, projects and also military campaigns strained the empire's economies finances shah jahan's health deteriorated and a power struggle erupted among the sons of the shah jahan so shah jahan had four sons so the four sons competed for uh, the throne so in 1658 uh, his son aurangzeb he emerged victorious and imprisoned his uh, own father shah jahan uh, shah, Jah- shah jahan was imprisoned by aurangzeb Uh, in agra fort uh, right <coughs> so in the war of succession he uh, aurangzeb defeated dara shiko right so he was the eldest son of shah jahan and uh, he was also designated he was designated to be uh, king or sultan uh, once uh, uh, i mean after the shah jahan's rule however aurangzeb could defeat dara shiko and he came to power right so this is about aurangzeb uh, sorry shah jahan right so aurangzeb right so uh, he is also known as alangir and uh, he was the seventh mughal emperor he was ruling from uh, 15 1658 to till his death that is 1707 right we can say he is the last of the last in the series of great mughal emperors right so rise to power if you see he was the third son of the uh, shah jahan so unlike his brothers uh, who were raised in luxury aurangzeb is known for his austerity and uh, we can say piety so he was a religious person he was a strict religious person right so a fight uh, developed or emerged between uh, shah jahan's eldest son dara shiko and uh, between aurangzeb so somehow uh, aurangzeb emerged victorious because of his his uh, ruthless uh, we can say military tactics so in this power struggle he killed all his three brothers including dara shiko right so this is his i mean earlier career so expansionist ambitions so aurangzeb expansion ru- i mean aurangzeb's regime uh, it's a Uh, expansion of the mughal empire empire it reached its greatest territorial extent during the uh, rule of aurangzeb right so he conquered vast areas in south including bijapur golconda and parts of assam also surpassing the achievements of his predecessors right right so this expansion however is also stretched the empire's military and administrative resources thin and uh, this also became one reason for the decline of mughal empire right so uh, we can say the religious policy of aurangzeb unlike his predecessor who were known for liberal liberal religious policy he followed strict muslim laws and tried expected from the people also uh, that they also should follow the islamic rules and regulations so because of that policy uh, because of that policy uh i mean uh we can see a uh, we can say a dissatisfaction among the people and this also his religious religious policy also became one of the reasons for decline of mughal empire right so because of this policy uh majority major sections of the hindu have been alienated and to contributed to rebellions particularly the marathas also uh, apart from marathas the rajput also rajputs also started rebelling but especially the uh, marathas they have become a formidable uh, we can say trouble uh, for the mughal empire right 
so eventually they played a significant role in the mughal decline the marathas right so complex he has a complex legacy right he was a brilliant military leader but uh, also efficient administrator however his religious policies and ruthless ruthless methods uh, they fractured the empire i mean empire's unity right so uh, his period also seen the decline of mughal empire right so his period was uh, i mean marked by constant warfare against marathas and rebellions within the empire right the vast empire became difficult to manage efficiently and coupled with this is is the mansabdari crisis mansabdari crisis also became one of the reasons right so by the time of his death in 1707 the seeds of mughal decline have firmly sown right so one of the reasons for the decline of mughal empire apart from all other reasons including mansabdari crisis the dakkan policy adopted or taken up by aurangzeb it is also considered as one of the major reasons for the decline of mughal empire we will see what is the dakkan policy so uh, aurangzeb was a we can say ambitious ruler, uh, ruler. so before him most of the north india has captured and some parts of the dakkan were also in the mughal empire so aurangzeb he wanted to conquer everything entire india including the south india so because of in this effort capturing the uh, south india or dakkan in, uh, dakkan he spent almost 25 years in dakkan only and he uh, directed everything all the resources of empire in capturing and waging wars in the dakkan so he was partially successful by the at the end of the day he could capture most of the regions uh, leaving some parts in south india also some region in maharashtra the pune region which is the stronghold of marathas so he could capture the entire region but it came with a great cost great cost so Uh, great cost and once aurangzeb aurangzeb has de- i mean his death occurred once again all these regional rulers they once again declared independence uh, j- briefly after the death of aurangzeb and once again the empire has seen destruction or dismantling i mean dismantling of the mughal empire right so expansion ambitions he had he wanted to expand the empire consolidation of power so after expansion he wanted to consolidate the power uh, religious considerations so most of the uh, the regional kingdoms that were there uh, in the dakkan also they were ruled by muslim muslim rulers only the rulers here also were muslims only so he wanted aurangzeb wanted that the all the muslim ruling uh, territories or we can say kingdom should come into the ambit of mughal empire so that was also one of the aspects of his dakkan policy so uh, he waged military campaigns against various kingdoms in the dakkan uh, including bijapur golconda culminating the capture in 1686 the bijapur has been captured and in 1687 golconda has also been captured after a siege of 6 months so he has to aurangzeb has to bribe a gatekeeper of uh, uh, the golconda fort and uh, that gatekeeper he has opened the doors of, uh, doors of golconda fort so because of that only aurangzeb could capture golconda right so he adopted the technique of siege warfare so he employed siege tactics to wear down the dakkan sultanates but these campaigns were resource intensive and stretched the mughal army uh, thin right outcomes territorial expansion we will see the expansion of the territories but uh, it has oh, it has seen it has resul- resulted in financial strain to the empire right so famously it is said that famously or infamously the ulcer the dakkan ulcer among all other things the dakkan ulcer dakkan ulcer that has ruined aurangzeb so this is a famous or we can say infamous saying also the dakkan ulcer among all other things the dak- the uh, dakkan ulcer that ruined the career of aurangzeb right so the unintended con- consequences of his dakkan policy are the rise of marathas 
and uh, guerrilla warfare the marathas have resorted to guerrilla warfare which aurangzeb could not uh, especially the successors of aurangzeb they could not face this uh, guerrilla warfares by especially shivaji and his uh, we can say other maratha leaders long term decline so his deccan policy resulted in long term decline of uh, we can say the the mughal empire right so this is about the uh, mughals and mughals the greater or we can say the uh, greater mughals so apart from that there are other mughal rulers are, are also there effectively the mughals ruled effectively till 1857 or we can say for the name say all other i mean uh, the mughal emperors after uh, the death of aurangzeb they are known as lesser uh, uh, mughals or later mughals so we will study about them when we study the uh, british uh, we can say modern era we will study them in the modern era how the weak series of uh, weak rulers caused i mean became responsible for decline of mughal empire and uh, gradually how gradually initially the marathas and later the britishers having uh, captured the stronghold i mean they become strong and started capturing all the regions in india all right so this is about the mughals uh, now we will see few questions that have been asked from this topic all right so the first question it is asked in 2021 question is uh, with the reference to medieval india which of the following is the correct sequence of correct correct sequence in ascending order in terms of size so basically you will see these words pargana sarkar suba you will see in the administration of mughals administration of mughals because of the paucity of time i am not discussing the administration of mughals so this is the sequence of uh, the ascending sequence of the administrative territories of or we can say the nomenclature of administrative units so first comes the suba we can say suba is uh, the province after that you will see sarkar and after you will see the pargana pargana we can say it is now equal to modern district right so suba we can uh, equate it with a uh, province so this is the ascending order of the ter territories in terms of size during the administration of mughals so the correct uh, option is first one only option a is a correct sequence of ascending order of territories in size so this aspect will come in the administration of mughals second question it is asked in 2015 right question is consider the following uh, the arrival of babar into india led to which of the following that is introduction of gunpowder in subcontinent uh, this is a in, this is an incorrect statement so the uh, babar also used gunpowder gunpowder during his wars especially the initial wars like battle of first battle of panipat uh, uh babar also used the gunpowder but before him only the mongols uh, when the mongols were waging wars uh, during the delhi sultanate period especially during the rule of altamash etc so that time only gunpowder uh, the indians india has seen the we can say the gunpowder right so this is a incorrect statement next is introduction of the arch and dome in the uh, in the regions architecture so this is also incorrect statement this style arch and dome style also ar arrived in india with the uh, we can say coming up of delhi delhi sultanate delhi sultanate so these are very easy statements easily you can eliminate you can adapt the strategy of elimination and eliminate the sentences third statement is establishment of timuru dynasty in the region so you know babar has roots from the chingiz dynasty uh, in changiz khan and also from the timur so he has the roots of timurid also so we can say the uh, mughal dynasty in a way it is a dynasty of timurid also because babar had the roots from the timur right so statement uh, correct option is option b only statement 3 is correct right so this is it for today thank you thank you for joining in the class uh, 
Thank you. Uh, tomorrow we will start with the modern India and the we will see the aspects like aspects like the important governor generals, right? So this is it for today. Thank you. Thank you for joining the class. See you next time. Until then, have a good day. Thank you.